Hi, everyone. We're coming up on Act 2, but before we do that, if you're new to this presentation, um, we have the slides available to you at bit.ly slash poet with a capital P and then tech, T-E-C-H, all capitalized. You can also scan that QR code or grab the link from the notes today. And um, the intention here is for us to be moving pretty swiftly through these. So don't feel like you need to learn at our pace, either just push pause, take a minute to um, take a look at one of the resources we provided, or enjoy the show for a little while and come back and take a look at them later. Act two, go with the workflow. Sometimes we want to strangle our devices, but sometimes they can really make our jobs easier. Here are a few great tools that we rely on. If you're having email issues, I feel bad for you, son. I've got 5,376,354 problems, but my Gmail ain't one. Email filters are a great aid to help us sort through the email raid, organize, inbox, our minds, unswayed. Why subject yourself each morning to the murky, foul-smelling inbox when you might instead be sipping from the crystal clear waters of a short list of messages from people you actually know that you might actually want to read at some point later after your copy has kicked in? Look no further, friends, because if you're not using them already, may I offer you the little known but undoubtedly most valuable gift I can, email filters. Every platform has them, but I'll show you Gmails very briefly since so many of us use it. And remember, deep breath, this is just learning at your own pace. I'm showing you some screenshots of how to do this. What you wanna do is check off one of the messages that you want to filter out, then click on the stoplight. That's those three dots up there in the corner. Then filter messages like these. So what you're looking for is a way to come up with the particular type of email you wanna get rid of, but you also have a chance to edit that later on. And it might not be something you wanna filter out, but something you wanna filter in, like starring it or moving it to the top of your inbox. All of those are possibilities. So now that you've done that, you've told the Goog which messages you wanna filter. Um, you wanna confirm or modify that selection using what I think of as the lowest common denominator, by which I mean, maybe just the emails you receive from one person, like your father. More specifically, the 789 that I've selected here to demonstrate just how closely sanity and email filtering are linked in certain family units. Love you, Dad. Please note, I zeroed out my inbox on January 1st, 2023. He used to work for the New York Times, and news is his business. Anywho, if you include too many variables in your filter, you're going to remove things you didn't intend to. So as I alluded to earlier, better to have five filters to do five things than one bigger one that ends up making certain messages inadvertently disappear. Uh, now that you know what, you tell the Goog where to put those messages or how else you might want to have them handled. And any combination of these things will work. So what you have is let's say skip the inbox or star it or apply the label. There's also this feature, which is 19 messages matching. So in this case, if you notice, I'm filtering ones that came from petdesk.com. And what that button does is retroactively fix your previous problems with your inbox. So you had at some point forgotten to create this filter. You hadn't had a chance to do it yet. It will typically go forward, but that little button that says apply filter to 19 matching messages goes back and retroactively makes it happen. And that's a really, really helpful piece of what you're doing. Oh, Mrs. K, we do feel your pain. Kate, dream with me for a moment. What might the world look like if my students read my feedback? Or I don't know, maybe did something with those painstakingly crafted edits that actually ended up improving their writing. Might I get more sleep? Might there actually be enough hours in the day to provide the kind of feedback I want to give? Alas, poor Moyer, you knew my hell. Dear students, I spent six hours on Sunday carefully crafting out thoughtful responses to your work. Why have you not read it? Instead, I will try moat. 
you can hear my voice in all its glory, providing you with content like a YouTube influencer. Influence those revisions. Save time giving feedback by recording your comments while building relationships with your students. Moat is a voice messaging Chrome extension that integrates with Google Workspace. Quickly record your voice and track student engagement. Moat will transcribe and translate all of your voice messages. Moat is great for giving personalized feedback and students love it because they hear the inflection of your voice as you give that feedback. That takes away all that, like she was mad at me because she wrote AWK next to my you know, paragraph. <laughs> And students can add the extension to their browser and they can respond back using voice notes as well. Moat's great for adding voice comments to Google Slides to make them more interactive. And it's perfect in Google Forms where voice comments can be left instead of written comments to make forms more accessible. Not only is it the perfect feedback tool, but you can use ready-made plug and play templates from Moat's Learning Hub to create micro podcasts, whole class audio discussions, narrated stop motion animation, audio rubrics, audio journals, speaking and listening exercises, and so much more. The free version of Moat allows for up to 25 minute voice notes per month. The paid version allows for unlimited five minute voice notes and voice to text transcription and translation for 34 languages for accessibility and the ability to save and reuse Moat comments. Be sure to check out Moat's YouTube page by clicking on the red book to learn more about this really powerful tool. Do you feel like your mouse is constantly on the run? Are you tired of the constant clicking? There has got to be a more efficient way to get menus and features than opening them over and over again. Keyboard shortcuts. Efficiency gets a big lift. Keyboard shortcuts can do the trick. Just a few keys pressed in fast, productivity soars unsurpassed. So time to fess up all you out there. Raise your hand if you're a multi-tabber. Now raise your hand if you typically have more windows open on your laptop than you do on the front of your house. I'm speaking about myself here too. I'm not blaming you. Okay. So if I can't get you to close those windows, at least you can zip around between them. In this instance, if you look across the top, you can see I've labeled these one, two, three, four. If you hit Command-1, Command-2, Command-4, Command-7, it bounces you between those tabs really quickly. Similarly, Command-T will get you a new tab. Command-N will get you a new window. Command-W closes whatever tab you have open. And then Command-Plus will zoom you in, and Command-Minus will zoom you out. However, I want to point out that as you're doing this, you might end up with a page that looks like that. If that's a problem, command zero will take you back to what it's supposed to look like. Now, let's turn to the 10 commandments. Moses has nothing on me. Well, perhaps the Red Sea and escaped infanticide. Oh, forgot Exodus guide. Well, here are my 10. Command Z, command Y, thou shalt undo, thou shalt redo. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Oh, yes, I did. Command A, thou shalt select all. Command U, B, or I, thou becometh underlined, bolded, or italicized. Command K, thou shalt be linked. You just highlight the text you want to link and hit Command K. Command Option M, thou shalt comment. So helpful. Just pops open the comment window in any Google product. Command forward slash, Thou shalt reveal all thy commandments. In other words, the menu that shows you all the keyboard shortcuts that are available pops up when you do that. Command backslash, thou shalt clear formatting. Gets rid of anything weird that you had in what you've already pasted and turns it into plain text. Command shift V, thou shalt paste it thy clipboard as plain text. So before you make the mistake of pasting in with the weird formatting embedded, you can clear it before it enters. And perhaps most valuable, command option shift V. So command plus option plus shift plus V. Thou shalt paste it the clipboard, but match the existing style. In other words, it turns whatever weird formatting you copied and turns it into whatever you've already selected as the formatting for what you want in this new text. And so that we might end these commandments under his eye. Blessed be the fruit. And may the window open. 
Command O or Command W. The red book in the corner will take you to a favorite website of mine, Board Teachers, which is a hilarious collection of resources curated and created by teachers for teachers. In fact, they do a comedy tour, they're so good. You'll land on their post called 101 Keyboard Shortcuts and um, in the need to know uh, sort of category that they have, but I encourage you to browse some of their other content too while you're there. So this is me in the early days of my teaching. Oh my goodness, I love everything about this job. I'm dancing on the counters. I love it, I love it. But slowly I begin to get weighed down by the grading and the degree to which my school life is bleeding into my home life. And I have left being a lawyer because there were no reasonable limits on my hours and no boundaries. And suddenly here I was again. To be honest, as much as I love tech, tech integration and it was a pull for me, and it's become my passion even, I was feeling pushed out or allowing myself to be pushed out by feeling so overwhelmed by the work of being an ELA teacher. And the same is true, I'm sure, for history teachers, people with a lot of grading to do. Hey, where were you when I needed you? Okay, so I've got this one. I haven't taken an assessment home to grade in over three years, which is about when I discovered blended learning. With blended learning, students can learn at their own pace. Their interests and goals take the race. Blended learning is the way to go for a future that's bright and aglow. First, let me introduce you here to another book, Balance with Blended Learning. Partner with your students to reimagine learning and reclaim your life. And she is not kidding. Blended learning is active, engaged learning online experiences combined with active, engaged learning offline experiences to give students more control over the time, place, pace, and path of their learning. It would take me days to share everything that I love about blended learning, but it really boils down to this. The blended learning model shifts the workflow of your classroom from a teacher-centered workflow to a student-centered workflow. A key aspect of this definition is positioning the students as active agents in the lesson or the learning experience. The students should be doing the heavy cognitive lift of making meaning. In blended learning environments, the students are doing the thinking, discussing, making, questioning, exploring, collaborating, and reflecting. This frees you up so that you can, in class, have time to interact directly with your students, conferencing, coaching, or teaching targeted lessons to small groups. I really hate to say that it's a magical solution, but really, it's a magical solution. And right now is the perfect time to start digging into blended learning. Grab a copy of Dr. Catlin Tucker's book, follow her on Twitter, dive into her blog, which is linked in the red um, book in the corner here, and be ready for September unlike any other. I'm not exaggerating when I say blended learning is how I changed my students' workflow to protect my sanity. And for just a peek into one tiny way that blended learning saved that sanity, the issue of grading. Learning in the learning the blended learning model will show you how to have your students do the heavy lifting of assessment too. This first screenshot is from an essay one of my students wrote. When they are done, they use the rubric to determine their own scores for each standard and highlight in their writing the evidence that they believe that supports each score. They then complete reflection questions for each standard, reflecting on their evidence, what they're proud of, and what they would do differently if they were to revise. Then when it's time for feedback, we sit down together for a speedy conference, or I use Moat to leave voice comments that they can listen to, and we discuss their reflection. And because I've used the blended model, blended learning model along the way, I've already conferenced with them during class time about their work. So I'm incredibly familiar with it. And so at this point, I just simply agree or disagree with their self-assessment and reflection detailing why. It makes them active stakeholders in their own learning. And it really gets rid of those parent emails that begin with, I have concerns about Johnny's score. Can you tell me why you gave him a two? Because not only is Johnny the one who did the assessing, but you've actually been requiring students to contact their parents via email and CCU as a way to take responsibility for their own work at various checkpoints during the process. So Johnny has been emailing his parents all along the way, keeping them abreast of his progress in class. All right, fine. I do know something about this now as a result of talking with Kate about it. So a great corollary to blended learning and often a facet of it is the flipped classroom. I often use the example of a math class to describe it. So you, the teacher, provide the lecture or the information that's pre-recorded, and their homework is to watch it. 
as many times as they need to until they get it. And then the class time isn't for lecturing, but it's for problem solving, making what used to be the homework into the classwork and what used to be the classwork into the homework. Get it? Flipped. And it works beautifully for ELA too, because you know who doesn't want to spend the entire class period on the Oxford comma or the magic of gerunds? We'll pause there for just a second so you can take a look at any of those tools you'd like and then start us up again in just a moment. Act three, or our all-you-can-eat tweet buffet, a selection of awesome ideas that we've gathered from our own online professional learning networks, or PLNs. Don't have your own PLN yet? Don't worry, that's act four. Our students live in a world where there is no longer a line between IRL and their online lives. They just treat it all the same. How can we help them navigate this? How can we get them to be digital leaders who take ownership of their lives both online and offline? Common Sense Education and Project Zero, the Alpha and Omega of Digital Citizenship. So you may have seen Common Sense Media's work. It's an amazing resource for parents and families. But Common Sense Education is truly the place to start for those of us connected to schools. There are fantastic resources of all kinds, but we'll highlight just a four of them here. Quick disclaimer for you, the Maine Department of Education partners with Common Sense Education for all of our work as ambassadors as it relates to digital citizenship. However, all of their resources are completely free and we gain nothing by directing you to them. Everything we're telling you about them, we really feel is invaluable and really the place to start. So taking the first and the second ones together, digital dilemmas and teen voices videos. The dilemmas are really thoughtful, well-crafted descriptions of various challenges that Gen Z faces as they interact with tech. They include discussion questions and they're categorized by subject matter and tagged for age appropriateness. They each take between 10 and 15 minutes to complete and we found these work really well as discussion starters as opposed to focusing on the specific problems that arise for students in your classroom. Because they're fictionalized but still very realistic, they offer the chance to talk about the issues without getting mired in whatever drama is percolating in your particular school. Then the Teen Voices videos offer similar access to content about issues teens face. Like the dilemmas, they afford the little bit of distance so the larger issue and not the person remains at the center of the discussion. However, unlike the dilemmas, these are actual teens telling their true stories, and we both agree that they are incredibly well done, no matter what age group you're working with. Like the dilemmas, the videos do have accompanying questions which can turn a single video into a 10 minute activity or can help you support a conversation about several of the videos over the course of a full class period, depending on how much time you want to give them and how much you want to show during a single sitting. Third and fourth from Common Sense Education are the digital habits checkup and the family engagement activities. While the entirety of the Common Sense media site is intended to be family facing, these are common sense education resources on the teacher side, specifically intended to be shared by teachers and schools with their students' parents and their guardians. And the digital habits checkup and discussion questions for the dinner table or that ride home from practice ask parents to add their voices and their own self-reflection to the mix as all of you are beginning to advocate for engaging with digital citizenship issues. Because as Kate and I say, every time we present about digital citizenship, no successful program is going to end simply because the bell rings. Families have to get involved with this, and they are by far the greatest influence on their children's tech habits, and we cannot and cannot be asked to do this work without them. Okay, so another Omega is the Center for Humane Technology, the people behind the documentary The Social Dilemma on Netflix, which we highly recommend if you have not seen it yet. The Center for Humane Technology has created a youth toolkit linked in the red book in the corner for use with students between the ages of 13 and 18. The toolkit has guides for educators that contain questions and activities that can be self-directed or worked through in a group or classroom setting. There are two types of guides, issue guides to learn about the issues and action guides where students can learn how to take action and use social media in healthy and positive ways. And none of it is cheesy eye roll inducing. These materials are honest and authentic. Hey Jonathan, don't you feel like you're always struggling to find things that don't violate copyright? 
As my students move from content consumers to content creators, where can they find high quality images and sound? CC images, aka Creative Commons images, are free to use as long as they're cited. And the creators have already granted permission that's embedded into the image. So with just a few clicks and some simple tricks, you'll find great CC pics. Let's start with Unsplash. Um, when you conduct a search here, the top bar is comprised of images you would have to pay for, but immediately below that film strip, you'll find tons of great options that are all Creative Commons licensed and entirely free. Same basic concept for Pixabay. Here I search for the word classroom, and you can see I got a mix of um, these kind of photos and then the artwork, and either way I can use them as long as I provide attribution. And finally, possibly my favorite tool to have discovered, Google Slides and Google Docs have Creative Commons embedded right in it. It is so easy. You just click the insert menu, then image, then search the web. And here I searched for Poetry Slam. This Google option is a great place to start any of your searches, especially if you're teaching this to a younger crowd. Um, I watched pretty much dumbfounded as my former colleague, Tom Charles Trey, taught kindergartners to perform image searches this way. And before I left, one of these three foot scholars signaled for me to bend down and a stage whispered to me, hey, even though they're free, you never ever use someone else's pictures unless you tell everybody they aren't yours, okay? Because otherwise it is stealing. Out of the mouths of babes, I was so impressed. And now with students creating content that needs sound effects too, we have a couple of places where they can find sound effects and music that they can use in their projects. Jonathan mentioned Pixabay for images, but it's also perfect for audio clips. Pixabay has a searchable audio library that students can use in their projects that includes music and sound effects. And if they can't find what they're looking for on Pixabay, the BBC offers free searchable audio clips as well. As we've said, we don't want our students to just be passive consumers of images and sound. We want them to be creators. To learn, students need to do something. And one place they can do that is Flip, formerly known as Flipgrid. To learn, we must create, that much is true, and what better medium than the moving screen? A video allows us to convey our point of view, to share our knowledge and make it seen. With careful planning, we start the journey anew. Our vision takes shape as we begin to dream. At last, we share the culmination of our coup, our knowledge and creativity, a work supreme. For when we create, we deepen what we knew, and in teaching others, we solidify our team. Flip is a free website and app that allows teachers to facilitate video discussions. Students are organized into groups and then given access to discussion topics. The topic space serves as an interactive message board where teachers can post questions and students can post video responses that appear in a tiled grid display. Flip has customizable security settings to help protect student privacy. A variety of filters and tools allow for text, stickers, screen recordings, and other possibilities. Via the immersive reading feature, students can see closed captions and translations too. And teachers have access to a help center and two active teacher communities, the Discovery Library for sharing topic templates and Grid Pals for connecting with educators and classrooms all around the world. When you click on the red book, you will be taken to a video tutorial that will help you get started with Flip. Okay, so in recent months, Kate and I have come to the unfortunate conclusion that there is some chance that there are other people with ideas about education besides just the two of us whose work is worth learning about. Oh, well, we've already mentioned a bunch of these rock stars, but we each independently found and now both love Matt Miller and his site, Ditch That Textbook. In this example from his blog, he offers eight ways to use Flip in the ELA classroom, plus 42 more Flip ideas for all the other subjects. The red book in the corner will take you to this particular post, but the whole website is just amazing. It's definitely worth a look. And better still, he mirrors the content of his longer posts, like this one, with an accompanying podcast episode. So if you're an auditory kind of person, this will allow you to access the brilliant content. So here he has reading responses going digital, 30-second book talk challenges, debating about a topic, celebrating the global read aloud all year long, rebooting a standard biography report, record an ongoing story, 
create a virtual vocabulary word wall, or speaking skills and assessment. Really neat way to use this tool and keep it much more vibrant and alive. And as Kate said, about the creation of the content instead of just the consumption of the content. As Matt says about his work, technology is changing the world and it's changing our schools and classrooms. It feels impossible to keep up with everything. You're, you're looking for meaningful ways to use technology and keep students engaged. Don't worry, you have come to the right place. But Kate, it is so sad that Ditch That Textbook has the only teacher podcast out there. I wish there were other podcasts we could turn to for advice and humor, thoughtful reflection or pedagogical support. Oh, well. Hey, Jonathan, he's not the only one. Podcasts are the perfect way for busy teachers to find good advice. Let me introduce you to my top three, the Cult of Pedagogy podcast with Jennifer Gonzalez, who hosts podcasts about teaching strategies, classroom management, education reform, educational technology. If it has something to do with teaching, she is talking about it. On her podcast, Gonzalez interviews educators, students, administrators, and parents about the psychological and social dynamics of school, trade secrets, and other juicy things that you will never learn in a textbook. Angela Watson hosts a podcast called The Truth for Teachers, where she focuses her work on helping us create and maintain a 40-hour week back and push back against educational mandates that don't make sense. And finally, Betsy Potash's podcast, Spark Creativity. Betsy single-handedly got me through the 2020-2021 school year with her innovative ideas and her empathetic messages to educators about how to take care of themselves when nobody else will. These are just a few of the people I look to for support for my work, but they are far from the only ones. It's so easy to feel isolated in this work, and I have come to rely on my network of rock stars to make me a better teacher. Okay. I love podcasts. But before those were a thing, I found another resource that I quite literally could not have done or continue to do my job without. Taking on the role of a tech integrator, but having no degree in tech and only a background of English teaching, I felt a lot like this poor castaway. I needed a ton of help and support to learn my craft. And I found the closest thing I could to graduate work in the form of a PLN that I developed and eventually befriended in person and then on Twitter. But what I quickly discovered, and the reason I tell you this tale of personal growth, was that tech integration was just a tiny corner of this world. And in fact, it was possible to look at any kind of educational issue, issue using a PLM that I developed in Twitter. Hopefully, you're beginning to discern a common thread among the many options we've been discussing here. Whether you consult web resources or podcasts or professional development opportunities like those you're experiencing today, our message to you is this. You are not alone. Your work is hard enough as it is, and those challenges need never be compounded by a sense of isolation. So to supplement and even catalyze or expand your use of websites, podcasts, and PD opportunities, enter your PLN and the amazing resources that teachers from around the world are sharing constantly online using hashtags like these. ENG Chat, originally created by the National Writing Project, now serves as a way to tag amazing ELA resources for all grade levels. And please note that each of the hashtags that you see on this island are live linked in their corresponding tweets on Twitter. However, even if you decided you don't want to dive in yet or you're not ready um, into Twitter as a place to look for these things, you don't need to have signed up. It's possible just to bypass the sign up process if you use one of the links that's um, on that island. We also have NCTE chat created by members of the National Council of Teachers of English. As I'll explain in a moment, this hashtag is used both to organize a monthly online discussion and to tag resources shared by participants in the chat. For this particular hashtag, participants have the option to meet on the third Sunday of the month at 8 p.m., meaning that the most recent event was on Sunday, March 20th, and that focused on National Poetry Month. And the red book in the corner will take you to NCTE's blog, where they post information about each month's discussion and also a link back to previously archived ones. And then finally, TLC or TL Chat, um, created by teacher librarians. While I suspect the majority of you have no librarianship responsibilities, the folks who use TLA Chat are huge teacher advocates. And as you might imagine, they're constantly offering resources and ideas that will change your classroom teaching for the better. Just a side note, it's the resources I discovered using this hashtag that rescued my professional life when my job description extended from tech integrator to library and instructional technology specialist in 2015. 
it was quite a change. And these people really made it possible for me to do that work. Moreover, it's the women and men I subsequently met through TL Chat um, and the ISTE National Conference that I attended, which is the parent organization of ACTUM, that eventually led me to become the president of the ISTE Librarians Network, which, among other things, gave me the opportunity to attend and present at the Future Ready Schools Conference, the White House. You believe me now, PLNs can change the course of your professional life. And for those of you who have not yet encountered chats on Twitter, they were originally intended to be half hour or hour long weekly or monthly synchronous discussions like NCTE chat. They focused on a question or questions related to a specific PD topic, and they were moderated by a rotating regular attendee. And that practice does continue, but the vast majority of blank chat hashtags emerge from these, and they have this kind of aspect to them where there's a weekly or a monthly chat connected. But that's not the only way, and as you'll see in a minute, you can use them to locate resources that answer some of your hardest questions, or that offer exactly the lesson plan gem that you need a half hour before class starts, or provide that inspiring quote to boost your morale sometime in the afternoon. And most importantly, you use hashtags at any time of the day or night on any platform. You can include just Googling them, and as you'll see in this example, you get first, if I uh, search teaching grammar, even though I'm using my quotation marks, the first two things that come up are resources I would have to pay for. But I do the exact same thing, and I search it with ENG chat at the beginning, and I get three really brilliant um, contributors who are offering me free resources. So using it just as a search term is really powerful as well. And this is not limited to ELA. As we said at the beginning, Kate and I both have our experience in the ELA classroom, but this is the case for history chat, SS chat for social studies, math chat has this, any subject that you'd like, you can very quickly find these kinds of resources irrespective of the subject matter. So having extolled the virtues of the content that hashtags can help you find, the people you find are gonna be just as valuable, if not more so. Kate and I have a running joke about our utter lack of prowess with all things athletic. So of course, our final act is gonna rely on our favorite sport ball analogy, the all-star team. And these are just 10 of the people that we trust and admire. Use them to find amazing resources and then other people you trust, others whose opinions you value or whose work impresses you, or use them to find other hashtags like those that we've already shared. However, before we meet our superstars, a word of caution. If you are looking for advice about how to teach, Elon himself is not your man. He's just not where you want to be looking. But if you're looking for advice and support and inspiration and resources and other sort of magic for the witchcraft of teaching, look right at Elon's platform, Twitter. Because in our experience, a carefully curated Twitter PLN is absolutely gold. As you look for possible candidates for your PLN, one quick tip, Space Karen, as we say, is profit-driven. So are all the changes he made to Twitter. So there's some ways around this problem. There are two really easy clicks that'll transform your feed. I no longer Google anything related to the work of tech integration. I've developed such an incredible PLN that all I do are these two clicks and use it as a way to find what I'm looking for. So first, I'm going to click on latest, which gets rid of whatever is being filtered out as um, Twitter believing it's the most important, which is frequently full of paid content, and then people you follow. And this won't work until you start to develop your PLN a bit, but I get literally instantaneous answers to the questions I have, and it really helps to do that. So this is going to be a really quick tour, as we said. Think about this as speed dating with these various individuals, but let's start off by swiping left on Elon. All right, this is the third time that I'm mentioning Betsy in this presentation. So clearly she has had a major impact on my teaching and on my students learning. Her podcast is a treasure trove of creative ideas that you can implement tomorrow. And her voice is like a warm blanket that will make you feel supported like no other. Second one is Pernille Rip. She is a fantastic literacy expert, and she is the kindest, most generous, insightful person, not to mention humble and brilliant, and really just a delight to work with, and really got me thinking a lot more about the role of literacy in my classroom and in schools in general. Angela Watson was the first educational expert who I felt saw me. 
get your life back with a 40 hour work week. There is no sugar coating on Watson's podcast. Cornelius Minor, who puts issues surrounding equity and access at the center of his teaching of ELA in New York City. Uh, shout out to the fantastic people at Heinemann. They've published Mr. Minor's phenomenal book in the Brave Happens series called We Got This, Equity, Access, and the Quest to Be Who Our Students Need Us to Be, which includes a beautiful forward by Kwame Alexander. By the way, this and all the other books that we have are connected to a Jamboard that we'll link for you at the end if you'd like to take a look in more depth at these. Uh, Kelly Gallagher and Penny Kittle are considered leading voices in literacy education. I will follow them anywhere. Check out their books, 180 Days, Two Teachers in Their Quest to Engage and Empower Adolescents, and then their follow-up book, Four Essential Studies, Beliefs and Practices to Reclaim Student Agency. These experts and their books got me started with book clubs, which revolutionized the way I approach reading and writing in my classroom. Ask Alice Keeler any and every question you have about any product in the Google Apps for Education suite. Believe me, she already knows the answer and she will immediately free up some of your limited time to do something much more creative or important than endlessly Googling, how do I fix my Google Doc formatting? She's already done it for you. Dr. Catlin Tucker is the blended learning guru and the reason that I no longer grade outside of my class time. That's right, not even during my prep. Pairing Dr. Tucker's work with Angela Watson's work will make you feel totally empowered and joyful. The School Librarian of Wakanda, School Library Journal, Librarian of the Year. What else is there that I need to say? Except the red book in the corner here is going to link you to the incredible PD resources that Casey's created. And it's one of the countless um, offerings that she's created for um, both teacher librarians and teachers to really just expand your understanding of how to use library resources in your classroom, really thinking through ways that research can be a piece of what you're doing in classrooms very seamlessly, and all of it free, all of it asynchronous, so you can do it on your own time. Uh, what do I not love about John Spencer? He will spark your creativity and transform your thinking about design thinking. He actually has a book called Launch, Using Design Thinking to Boost Creativity and Bring Out the Maker in Every Student. And about a day after I discovered it, his book and his website became the foundation for creating and now running the makerspace at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. And finally, Nick Provenzano. Nick is now, like me, a tech integrator, having been previously, like me, an English teacher. So pretty much pretty cool guy. Um, any and every tech tip you need with ELA as your focus, because you used to be a teacher of English, is somewhere in Nick's domain, including his blog, which is linked here in the corner, and addresses any other areas of teaching as well. TPT, Twitter pro tip, follow the people who the people you follow, follow. In other words, to expand your PLN, try perusing the accounts of people your mentors are following and not your mentor's followers because who cares who follows them? It could all be crazy people like Kate and me. Our epilogue, if you're not the future, we have one last thing to share that we hope eases your mind a bit about the future of teaching and learning in your ELA classrooms. We have a little secret. But first, the laptop crashes, the Wi Fi's down, the printer fails, and we all wear a frown. With cords and cables tangled and twisted, our frustration with tech can't be resisted. We long for the days of chalk and blackboard where things were simple and nothing ignored, but progress marches on and we must adapt, though sometimes tech makes us angry, and that's a fact. AI, artificial intelligence, is very quickly changing our world. Just this week, over 100 new AI platforms have entered the market. So we've been playing with the one that everybody in education is talking about, ChatGPT. And guess what? All those poems that we've shared with you today? Yeah, we wrote those with ChatGPT. Click on the little red book to check out Matt Miller's ongoing mega blog post, ChatGPT, Chatbots, and Artificial Intelligence in Education, where he is curating his thoughts, ideas, and resources for educators. 
and don't just take our word for it. Nick Provenzano, the last person on the all-star team, was getting a ton of questions about AI in the classroom. So he asked ChatGPT, why don't teachers need to worry about you? And honestly, Kate and I were pretty impressed with his response. Teachers play a crucial role in fostering critical thinking and problem solving skills in their students. They do this by encouraging students to think deeply about concepts, ask questions, and engage in discussions and projects that require creativity and innovation. ChatGPT, while it may provide answers to questions, cannot facilitate the kinds of hands-on learning that help students develop these important skills. Teachers provide a level of education and support that a machine simply cannot match. AI is even making its way into some of our favorite educational platforms. Padlet now uses AI to create slide decks from your text. Parlay uses it to create prompts. Canva uses text to image to create custom images. And just two days ago, they released a whole new suite of tools um, powered by AI. Bing is about to launch text to video and Grammarly Go is about to revolutionize how we write with AI. Check out a recent blog post from Alice Keeler, 100 prompts for teachers to ask ChatGPT and see how you can use it to simplify your workflow. And also we can recommend Common Sense Education's incredibly well done research and thinking about how AI is changing the classroom. They're thinking not just about digital citizenship issues, but just how technology is impacting teaching and learning in really thoughtful ways. So again, if you haven't looked at them yet, there's our link bit.ly slash capital P poet, capital T-E-C-H. All those bit.ly links are case sensitive. We'll also put in the notes um, for this video, the link to the Jamboard that I mentioned where we've had teachers contributing to those resources. All the books we mentioned are there and also some other ideas about using tech and tech tools have been there as well. Kind of a shared resource for us to create. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we hope you have a great rest of your day.